I am here to introduce Richard DeBello, um, who really needs no introduction, I think, for this audience, uh, whether you're here with us in person or whether you're online. Um, all of us got his bio. Uh, if you're online, Google him. You'll find out all about him. What I will say is he has the task of implementing SPD3. Huge task for us in this room and trying to figure out how to do space traffic management and keep a global economy going. Um, so Richard came into this position almost a year ago, probably hard to believe that. Um, and so he is gonna talk to us today about what he's been doing as the director from the um, Office of Space Commerce. So Richard, over to you. This being Austin, I thought I'd use a roving mic, right? It seems more like live music. Did anyone, how's everyone doing? Are we great? Yeah, yes, sir. Anybody hear any live music last night? One person, there you go, that's a failure. I've been here twice, I've yet to hear live music. I, I, I hear a rumor that this is a pretty good place to do it. I'd like to actually check that out when I have some time someday. Um, I'm happy to do this any way you all want. I can talk or we, or I can answer questions. I mean, you all know uh, Commerce Department is launched on uh, as a result of Space Policy Directive 3. We're launched on a journey to replicate the DOD SSA system. Um, I'm happy to, we just finished up an R5. I think 45, 47 really good responses back. And, we just finished up a pilot. So there's a lot thing going on and I'm happy to answer questions about that or I'm happy to talk. What, what, what feels, talk? You want me to talk? You want to ask questions? We could do both. Both. Oh my God, Larry Martinez. <laughs> <laughs> They're flying them in from the West Coast. Happy's right over there. Happy, good to see you. I feel like this is uh, like you know one of those shows where people show up from your past and it's um, okay. Let me start. Let's start with um, let's start with Archie Lee. Archie Lee was hired in 1929 uh, by the St. Louis Airport, and Archie's job was to stand on the field with a red flag and a checkered flag, and he the red flag. I think we can pretty safely guess meant not safe. And the checkered flag said safe to land. Okay. So the reason I mentioned Archie is that we tend to forget when we're running to the airport to get on a plane and flying around the world to go to an SDM conference. We tend to forget the complexity of that tool that we take for take uh, for granted. We went from a guy in a field with two flags to an interconnected global enterprise that's capable of flying about hundreds of thousands of planes a day around the planet. <clears throat> and so I think a little bit of humility is in order for us as we think about what are we doing on uh, STM. So we are at the beginning. We're not at the Charlie League phase of the beginning but we're not very far along in our journey. The one thing that bothers me the most is that we're pretty good at something that we need to be consistently excellent at. And the difference between pretty good and consistently excellent is the difference between me telling you that there could be a conjunction and me telling you that you need to maneuver now or you need not to move. We are so far away from that, okay? We are on the journey, but we're probably a decade away from that. And I hope you all disagree with me on that, but we're probably a decade away from that. So the, um, the, the other twin problem that we have, is, and again, sticking with the uh, air traffic analogy, <clears throat> Imagine, if you will, that a major fraction of all the airplanes that have ever flown are still in the air. And that's sort of what we have here with space. 
So uh, nothing lands gracefully except for a few unique objects. Um, and we, there's a lot of talk about active debris removal. I, I love the topic, but today there's no great ideas out there. Um, yes, we can build a satellite to go grab a satellite. And whether that makes economic sense is for me, a very, very, very large question. There's been a lot of interesting theoretical science about pulsing things with lasers, and a bunch of other stuff, but by and large, there are no great solutions for active debris removal. If we make a mess in space, we literally don't know how to clean it up. So we, we, again, a certain, I think we have to have a certain amount of humility when we talk about space traffic, when we talk about SSA, and definitely when we use words like straight space traffic management, because quite frankly, it's a bit of an overstatement. <clears throat> Second big issue that I worry about is international. China's not playing. I'm not bashing China. I realize that's in vogue these days. I'm just making an observation. We wouldn't let a China Airlines flight land in Austin without being on our air traffic control network, and they wouldn't let one of our United Airlines planes land in Beijing without being on the air traffic control network. We have China flying a lot of stuff. They have, a, they have aspirations. They're going to build a uh, Starlink-sized constellation. They have human space flight. They're doing a lot of really interesting things. And we are still emailing each other and writing each other demarches about space traffic control. It is comically insufficient, comically insufficient. Um, the other political thing that I worry about is the, a lot of the EU is standing up its own SSA network. It's certainly, I respect their right to do that. I suspect we'll see several more. We probably, like GPS, we could have four, five, six more separate networks. But then you have to stop and think about that. You have separate sensors uh, with different biases. You have different analytics. All trying to receive, uh, all trying to do the same job, and there's no common reference system today. So if EUSST tells Inelsat your object is here, there isn't an easy way today to know how that answer compares to my answer, and that's a problem because we the, that problem is going to get more complicated uh, rather than less. So. Um, We've referenced SPD3. I, I reread it on the plane. I, I, so, you know, it kind of makes me laugh. It, you, you have to get to page 13 before it actually says that anybody needs to do anything. Um, on page 13, it says, the secretaries of defense and commerce, they didn't even put us first. I mean, they <laughs> kind of like, that, that's a vote of confidence, isn't it? The secretaries of defense and commerce, and, and then in coordination with everyone, because these are interagency meetings and everybody wants their, their very own name on there, should cooperatively develop a plan for providing basic SSA data and basic STM services, either directly or through partnership with industry or academia. Okay, that's one line in a 16 page document. Not a lot of detail there for building a plan. First of all, what's a basic service? Uh, use Views differ. If you're a satellite operator, you want a basic service to be everything, completely, everything. I want the platinum package and I want it for free. If you're an SSA service provider, you're like, whoa, 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 you're killing my business, right? I mean, you're giving away the stuff that I invested my own money to do. Um, SPD3 is not really any help on this issue. So we went out. Uh, last week, or actually two or three weeks ago, with our list of what we said, hey, we think these are basic services and we think these are not. And we asked the world, your, you, uh, what you thought. And as I mentioned previously, we got like, I think it was 47 responses back. 
Some of them very detailed, some of them uh, very thoughtful. Um, and so we're chunking through that data now, um, and we hope uh, to have some kind of public forum where we can talk about the results and where we're going. Uh, we're making these decisions separately from EUSST. So it does allow for forum shopping. If you're a satellite operator and you don't like my package, you can just go, well, Rich, I'm not really interested. Sign up for both three. Well, there you go. They'll sign up for both three. Um, so it, that's sort of the, the little bit of chaos of the world we're, we're heading into. Uh, and then finally, we are, we the government, and we are aware that our presence in any market is disruptive. It, it almost has to be. We're going to walk into a marketplace and we're going, we're going to bring a lot of money in and we're going to disrupt the market. So, and they're going to, and as a result of our entry, there's going to be winners and losers. Um, and what we're trying to do on our side is to minimize the impact of that uh, by trying to acknowledge the existence of the commercial services that are there already and to, um, and to try to build a system that actually uses some of those services. But at the end of the day, it's going to be a government, it's going to be a government service. Um, so again, we'll be trying to uh, reach out early and often to make sure that we're doing this in the most minimally impactful way um, that we can. Again, my hope is that, and I'm working, you know, everything you ever work with the lawyers on everything. I mean, I'm what I'm trying to do is a bunch of public fora where we just stand up and talk. I think the restriction is I can't officially ask for guidance from the private sector, but I can talk about what we're doing. So I'm gonna to try to, we're gonna have one for the R5. We're gonna have, we just finished the geo pilot, which was, which was pretty cool. We did a geo SSA on 100 satellites with zero government data. So that was that was a really cool exercise. We did that with uh, JCO and the in DoD, um, and uh, and we are that all that data is currently being uh, uh, analyzed now, and hopefully we'll be able to um, hopefully we'll be able to have a uh, a session on that specifically. And then I'd also like to do a session, and I, I just did this for the government a couple of days ago, where I walked through what I think are acquisition strategy and our build plans. And I wanna share that with the commercial sector also. <clears throat> so we have, uh, so there's a, there's a big job to build this new system. Um, so far, DOD's been great. Um, the only thing, you know, they haven't had, I mean, they're actually been encouraging us to go faster. Uh, as, and they would like, uh, I think as everyone here knows, I mean, DOD would like to focus on space domain. They would like to focus on space domain awareness and not on SSA. So they want to they wanna refocus on their core task, which is, you know, security and what's going, and there's a lot going on in space. Um, these days that they need to pay attention to. Um, I do like that the SSA sensors got used on the great balloon escapade a few, <laughs> a few, a few weeks ago. That was, that was a little fun uh, thing. Um, so um, we're talking about building program and hardware and all that kind of stuff, but there's a whole other piece of this, which is what are the rules by which nations are going to operate? Um, there's a lot of talk about sustainability. I mean, um, and there's a lot of good work being done. I mean, uh, MIT rolled out, MIT and the World Economic Forum rolled out a space sustainability index. And anyway, so there's a lot of work on the issue of what are, and I think that there will come into focus um, a question of what are the operator's responsibilities? Right now, the without getting into all the boring detail. Outer Space Treaty says governments are responsible for the actions of their citizens in space. So right now the government is ultimately responsible for anything anybody does. Um, the question is, what, how will this evolve? What are the things that operators uh, need to do, should do, 
um, not only in the U.S., but globally, and how do we start this in the U.S. and inspire a global response? For example, some operators are a lot better than others at knowing where their assets are. Um, so, but there's no like test, there's no certification for, you can't fly a satellite unless you have a license. There, there is no such thing. Um, the, the, the ways, the, one of the strong things we struggle with is, is just operators talking to each other. About a decade ago, the geo operators got together and created the Space Data Association. Uh, they did that with our good, uh, they did that with our good friends at Comspot. Um, and um, that became a platform for the geo operators to have a dialogue about their changing needs and, and, the, and the changing environment, and also to fly more safely. Um, we, we have a situation in LEO, as all of you know, is like 10 times as complicated now. Um, Starlink ran forward with the first mega constellation. We have plans for a number of other mega constellations and basic things like what's the carrying capacity of LEO? I mean, is there, is that a number? Is that an askable question? How many of these constellations? I mean, put aside the mind boggling spectrum issues that the FCC has to deal with. Um, just physically, what do we think? What's the carrying capacity? How many tens of thousands of satellites do we think? Space is big, true, but how many? So how do we do it? So there's, and so all of these things will, will eventually lead back to what are the responsibilities of operators? Right now, we use, for example, important uh, principle. In geostationary orbit, we developed the principle of first come, first serve. It sounds kind of childish, but it is basically a hugely important position. It's a hugely important principle for operators. It means if you're first to get an orbital location, you can stay there in perpetuity as long as you uh, keep replacing your satellite. And the question is, does this apply to LEO? So, and what does that mean for countries who are not as advanced or, or, or next generation systems that may be more efficient but can't get access physically to the orbits? So there are all these really complicated political science questions that have to be sorted out uh, too. So that is the journey that we're on. Um, we have good support. Uh, I mean, my secretary and deputy secretary, uh, Gina Raimondo and Don Graves, have been great, have been super supportive. Um, DOD's been supportive. Um, their State Department and others are all, you know, are sort of working, we're all working together on this, but it's just a really, really hard problem. And solving it, it's unlike air traffic control where you could solve it for an airport or you could solve it for a country we're immediately international. So it doesn't, it is not the case that whatever we do, other people have to do. People can go their own way. And so we need to convince, not direct. We need to be the best. We're not yet. I mean, we're probably the best comparatively right now, but we're not where we need to be by any, by any stretch of the imagination. So that is the, the world that I'm living in. And I have to tell you that I had my own rather simplistic view of the complexity of this problem when I walked in the door a year ago. And it has been an amazing journey so far. Uh, but, I, but again, I learned so much by talking to people and we have all these great commercial companies that are coming in routinely and telling me how lost I am. <laughs> and 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 so the uh, and my government colleagues have also been really supportive. We have a great contractor team. Uh, we have a great team of really smart contractors. You know, I, I'm actually uh, I should, probably shouldn't admit this. Uh, I'm actually a lawyer, and you know, we didn't, Kepler wasn't on our reading list when I was in law school. So a lot of this for me is has been a really struggle to get up to get up the learning curve. But with, uh, uh, with the brave Mr. League in mind, 
on standing on that field in the middle of winter in St. Louis, Missouri, I think we can look forward and see a path where we really do have a space traffic control network and we really do know where everything is and we have active debris mitigation and we have international rules for the for uh, for for clearing orbits when we need to and we have technologies at our fingertips that we can go clean up a mess with so all of those things I can see I probably obviously uh, I'm probably not going to be here when all those things get implemented um, but the next generation and the generation after that uh, it will be, we will have that. And then we're going to have operations around the moon and on to Mars and all of that stuff. And all of that's going to require space traffic control. So it's a big, big, big job. And for all of you, you who are just starting out on your careers, good luck. It's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, this is, it's going to be a great, it's going to be a great industry to be in. So I'm happy to answer questions um, if you haven't. And read Space Policy Directive 3 just for the fun of it, if you have <clears throat> Yes. I'm wondering if you have thought about uh, setting up what is normally the course of action and something that, like a NIST body for standards to try and get uh, the way they did with cybersecurity and others, identity ecosystem security groups. Uh, yes, NIST is working on standards and, and as luck would have it, one of the leading experts on standards is sitting right next to you. Uh, would you like to just say a couple words about the international uh, organization? Yeah, I'd be pleased to. But, um, there are international standards being developed, and they're basically of two types. One is best practices, where you could put rules of the road. There are many countries clamoring for rules of the road. And I said, fine, here's a section where we'll put some stuff. And they can't agree. And they can't come up with something that the operators can actually use and, and live with. That's on the best practice side. Then there's also data exchange standards. And uh, I think the best venue for that, or the most effective today, is the CCSDS group. This is consultative, uh, I'm going to committee. draw a blank, committee for space data citizens. And they're making these standards for sharing orbit data, maneuver data orbit determination data, physical characteristics of satellites, um, spacecraft operator phone book information. There's attitude data, there's re-entry data, there's probably soon to be launch data and fragmentation data. It goes on and on. Uh, and these standards have, have largely been adopted by the operator community, although there's a lag for those being pulled into the orbit determination systems that operators have. There can be a 15 year lag. So, that, to me, that just says with, with Rich is talking about in a decade, we hope to have things in a much better place. Standards, as dull and boring as they are, are important to get together now so that operators can adopt them. It takes a lot of time if you have a satellite that is a 15 year life. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Rich. Uh, Vic from Leo Labs. So uh, we saw the collision avoidance screen for launch toilet in the, in the RFI, but, but not a whole lot on launch tracking and, and things of that nature uh, post, you know, post liftoff. Um, there's a pretty good body of evidence that when launch providers lean in and pay commercial SSA industry to track, um, they have a much lower mortality rate than if they're just reliant on the current service from the 18th. Which, which can only take weeks to, to get a PLE, and by then, you know, your satellite is, is dead. What is your uh, plan or perspective on should commerce be including uh, launch tracking services as part of a basic service? Um, or is, do you leave that to industry to, think, to you know, deal with that? Is that an advanced service? Thanks. I think, you know, it's one of those issues. We've already had uh, outreach from both FCC and FAA on, on this issue. Um, it's a little bit early for us to play a meaningful role in that. Um, but I mean, clearly there's a need. Um, and as people launch uh, missions with multiple, you know, multiple, sometimes many satellites into and through constellations of other people, as you point out, they're, they're, it's, it's a little bit hair raising at the beginning when you don't have a good track on any of the objects. 
Um, I don't really, I mean, we are, we, we had a big debate about launch COLA um, itself um, and whether or not it should be included as basic service. And we ultimately ended up saying, yes, it should be, but we haven't really, I'll be honest with you, we haven't really fully defined what the boundaries of that are. And that would be a dialogue that we would have with the FAA. Um, and I've talked to uh, Kelvin Coleman, who's my counterpart there uh, a couple of times about this. And we just haven't had time to sit down and really dig into it yet. So, I mean, I acknowledge your question is a really good one and I, I don't have a really good answer yet. So there's some of it has to do with the DOD and the SPD3, there's the cataloging function which is retained by the DOD. So cataloging new launches is, is, is something they'll continue to do. Um, there's the COLA gap, which I think is what we mean in between after the launch happens and before things start appearing in the catalog. That is probably something that needs to be worked on. That, yeah. that falls after the FA Department of Transportation's role is done. So that's probably something that would fall well, commerce. So. Mark raises a bigger issue that we're debating in another part of the administration now, which is that there are gaps that have opened up in the regulatory authorities for the various agencies. And whatever you think about regulate, regulation is a charged word. So just think, of, try to imagine it as the boundary between government and industry. Uh, there has to be some kind of coordination function. Um, but uh, with, in, for example, we, my little group, we actually license all Earth remote sensing. Uh, but we can't license Hawkeye 360 because they don't image the Earth. They are gathering radio uh, signals. Um, so because they're gathering RF data as opposed to um, uh, photons, um, we can't license that. So they don't really have a licensing authority. And questions of who, I mean, NASA is very concerned about who will license LEO um, habitats. So right now there isn't anybody. Um, and, and as Mark just said, the you know, FAA loses jurisdiction once the launch is done. So there are these gaps. And so one of the things we're like in the White House, the Space Council is working on this. It, You'll hear it referred to generically as mission authorization. And they are, I've been saying this for months, they are nearly done. Um, nearly being a fairly, uh, I don't know exactly how many weeks nearly is, but we're involved in the process. We've made our positions pretty clear about what role we want to play, but there are these gaps and, and that'll be a dialogue with Congress about how we go about filling those gaps because eventually there'll have to be new regulation with uh, Republican Congress, uh, there's uh, obviously some pushback on the concept of regulation in general. And so this will be a, a tap dance that the administration does with, with the Congress eventually. Way back. So um, just real quick, uh, RF as part of the electromagnetic spectrum is transmitted by photons. So I'm curious, <laughs> millimeter waves, et cetera, et cetera, microwaves, uh, anyhow. My you know, question. the lawyers said we can't regulate it. I, I'm going to have to fall back on that. I said, are you kidding me? And That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I'll introduce myself, Stephen Wood. I am a patent attorney and space lawyer. So I'm really curious what you said about the principle of first come, first serve. And how, uh, as a lawyer, would you distinguish that as uh, different from the principle of, um, you know, uh, no territorial um, uh, you know, acquisition. We happen to have a professor in the audience who actually teaches us. So no, I'm talking about Larry Martinez behind you. Larry. They talk about equitable access, and, and there's a tension between first come, first serve, and equitable access. But really, what they want to do is they want to uh, most efficiently utilize the spectrum, which is oversubscribed. So the thought of having a spectrum band remains vacant while well, somebody gets their act together with the national zoo, the ITU. So it gets used by who's there, but you have to bring in service, you have to apply. So it's a lot more bells and whistles and moving parts than just you get it forever. 
And, and so my question isn't necessarily about the spectrum side, but about the satellite side. Physical. And you kind of claim that physical space as long as you're replacing that satellite. Yeah. Is, is that not a claim that you're constellation up? You have to, it has a certain lifetime. And yes, you can replace it, but your authorization from the ITU is, is finite, not infinite. The, this is an easier question at GEO. As you all know, geostationary orbit is. The satellite is at a distance from the Earth such that its orbit matches the spin of the Earth exactly so that it's stationary with respect to the Earth. So in GEO, you actually had people, those that was beachfront property, right? So once you had a GEO slot, if it was a good slot, that was, you were guaranteed minting money. So the first come first serve meant that uh, operators do a lot of, things to make sure they never lose that. Like, you know, if the satellite was going to die, they'd move an older satellite into the slot just to hold the slot. Or sometimes they'd even do deals with other countries to move us to temporarily move something there. It, it's the rules in Leo are not clear yet uh, about how first come first serve would work. For example, can we tell can, you know, can the FCC modify uh, Elon's license for Starlink to make, you know, to make their use more efficient? I mean, what are, what is the extent that we can mandate to operators efficiency, which is a different thing. Larry, did you have anything you wanted to? Well, yeah, I mean, you touched on it. Is, uh, is, is, is the Leo claims by some operators that they will have a particular orbital plane is that comparable to the geostationary slot idea that you were talking about? And so first come, first serve, we have this orbital plane at a certain altitude. Do we have those sorts of uh, uh, rights for the future? If we keep replacing satellites, are we in essence able to continue using that plane uh, without any further authorization required? Has the ITU spoken on this yet? No, that's that would be what my question is, is that if you were to have a, a magical ability to write the agenda for the ITU or for Kokos, what would you like to see coming up on that agenda? Oh, wow. Uh, that's that's a big that's a big one. I, I actually. Uh, Larry and I were actually together at a conference like last year, I think, and I and there were a bunch of space lawyers at our table and I asked them, I said, seriously, first come, first serve, that's the best you guys can do? I mean, that's it? That's your That was your idea that you had like 50 years ago and you're sticking with it? And no one's thought of a new one. We're just gonna go with first come, first serve? And they all looked at me like, huh? I, so I can't answer the question. I don't have any great ideas, Dan. Yeah, I was going to Touch base though with the, the concept that Geo and, and Leo are totally different. They aren't. The IQ does have rules for Leo and it protects Leo. So, in a way, the first come, first serve that exists in Geo also is affecting Leo because they can't broadcast between 15 degrees to the equatorial plane. They have to make sure that whatever terminals they enable are not interfering there. There, there are rules for that. I disagree kind of with the, the statement that Leo is is 10 times more complex because although there's drag there, um, radars are doing quite well at positional accuracy in Leo. Geo has a lot more inaccuracy and makes it more challenging. And even though there are slots defined, that doesn't mean that the operators can't wander outside of those. It just means that from an ITU perspective, they aren't protected from others and they can't interfere with others. And this is all an ecosystem here. This is not Leo's totally different than Geo. In the RF sense, they're totally tied together. Let me ask you a question, Dan. Um, as we move out beyond Geo to CISLUNAR and start doing lunar and translunar comms, how do you see this? How do you see this working? Well, okay, so the ITU is using something called equivalent power flux density. It's like a ceiling, and you can't go above that. So right now, we've been adding, okay, the, the RF energy for GEO has this profile, and the LEO guys are going to add this profile. And this lunar 
going to have to live in that same sort of profile so it doesn't interfere with other actors. And it's probably the same sort of thing with Leo that whatever terminals and and ground stations are used and satellite broadcast, this all is going to have to be added up in this ETFD construct unless IQ comes up with something different. And I just sent an email to an IQ colleague that's in the regulatory side this morning. Um, I'm not aware that there's any better thing than kind of than first come first serve. Right. Yes. Um, yeah. I uh, I kind of disagree with the first come first serve point of view. You know, I'm Native American. I'm United. Um, I noticed on your page 13, it doesn't say anything about working with tribal governments, which is a problem for me. Um, so when it comes to first come first serve, uh, Native American people can oppress these states. Um, so I, I think that the first come first serve is uh, disenfranchising. Yeah, yeah, there there's a huge portion. I mean, the, this is, debate has been has been brewing globally. Obviously, uh, not only Native Americans, but um, pretty much any developing country who has aspirations. And you know, I I think pretty much everyone does now to be part of the space community. The fact faced with the fact that when you come a decade from now. All the real estate's got is all the real estate is already claimed, and that you have no path in. I think, as Mark said, the 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 reason for first come first serve is efficient use of resource. Um, it basically says if you're not losing it, you if you're not using it, you lose it. But if you're using it, you get to keep it. But what does it do for the people who are not in? And it's not just Native Americans. It's you know it's uh, the space programs of Africa, which they just Africa just Africa is of course fifty four countries, but Africa the African Union just kicked off their the space agency. Well, you know who knows? Like three generations from now, Africa could be the leader in space. They have tremendous resource, tremendous human resource, and tremendous natural resource. So, but when they get ready to go to space uh, 20, 30 years from now, what, what are they gonna be able to do? And that's not just radio frequency spectrum, it's not just orbital positions in LEO, it's once the race to the moon and all the, you know, the moon is pretty big, but the place, the good places on the moon are pretty few. And so once those are all gathered up and divided by the major powers, what's left for everyone else. So I think it is, uh, I think first come first serve, which is why I challenge the space lawyers. I think first come first serve is a social justice issue. And I think we need creative people to, to turn their minds to how would you do this? You remember they tried and failed in the eighties, um, the, the law of the sea and then the moon treaty were supposed to be ways to equitably redistribute uh, redistribute resource and uh, the major nation I think I don't know Larry how many people I ended up signing oh, about 19. yeah but the US the US was strongly opposed yes yes oh yeah. yeah and the same holds true for the law of the sea common heritage of mankind but the right. that also failed to really get implemented these are really, really fundamental and really, really tough social justice issues. And they matter and they're going to matter. So do, do something creative, do good work, reinvent this, you know, up at the top. Yes, sir. Uh, turning to the uh, Joe Guzman, I'm with uh, Space Cowboy ADR, doing active debris remediation. Hope to work, work with you someday. All right. I hope, um, I hope to see your great successes. Turning to the the, uh, the the costs of such, can you uh, explain the parallels like between how the FAA is funded? Is it a balance between uh, taxpayer money and money that comes from the industry itself? Uh, how does that work, and how what are the parallels that can go into space traffic management? Yeah, I think the interesting thing about air traffic. Let's just focus on air traffic control because FAA does a lot of other stuff. They have certification programs. I mean, they have to certify new planes, and there's a lot of stuff the FAA does for the aircraft industry that we don't replicate in the space industry yet. 
but let's just focus on air traffic control. So different countries have made different decisions. Uh, Canada uh, and some European countries have privatized air traffic control. So basically the government uh, pays uh, partly, but, the, but uh, airlines pay fees to maintain uh, public air traffic control. We decided um, this was something that there have been several attempts by Congress to take a run at this in the US. Um, I think the last one was maybe during the Bush administration, I can't remember. Um, but uh, it's always been defeated in the US. And um, so the argument for privatization is that it's easier for a private company to bring new technologies to bear more rapidly at lower cost. The counter argument is the government wants, feels like aircraft safety should be a function of the government and not of a private company. So th these are hot button issues, often debated on motion rather than fact. Um, and I think there are good facts on both sides, both sides of the argument. So I think, um, so your question is, well, how does what they're doing on their so, so the same thing I think would apply. SPD-3 said Commerce Department and DOD should stand up a separate SSA system. Um, in part, that's because I think there wasn't high confidence that they could just replicate it commercially. And I know there are, there are views to the contrary there, but the, I think we could, where we are today technically, I think we could probably uh, to let the commercial sector do uh, SSA at GEO. Um, Leo is harder. And right now, I don't, my personal opinion is that we couldn't do it without the DOD's network, the SSN, uh, Space Surveillance Network. Uh, DOD has a, has a network of telescopes and, and radars that are very sophisticated, more sophisticated than what exists in the commercial sector today. Uh, but, you know, technologies change. So we made the decision today that we're going to stand up a government system. And again, that gets back to my point that we will impact the industry. In your case, it may, we may impact it in a positive way. We may become a buyer of your services. Uh, and other, co other companies may become buyers of your services. But I, I think it's, you just have to acknowledge that where we are right now, it's we're at the beginning of a long process. And we're probably going to make some decisions right, and we're probably going to make some decisions wrong. And hopefully over time, we'll get it right. Rich, when, when you say government system, you don't mean DOC people sitting in Vandenberg, civil servants pushing buttons. You are actually going to be contracting out all the work to private industry, right? That, that, it, what I mean by a government system is there will, our system will reside on a cloud, uh, in, you know, all the data and the analytics will be inside of a government cloud structure. So we will be using commercial data, we'll be using commercial services as inputs to our processes, but the processes will be inside a government system. I think is the way to put it. We want, obviously a goal is to, and it's in our charter, a goal is to make maximum use of commercial capabilities. And we want to do that. Yes. Yes, uh, that, you know, Native American again, Oneida, we're looking at our own spaceports, the launch operators, the you know, satellite operators. So my, I have a liability question about move, not move. So in the future, obviously, as we put more satellites up, we're going to have uh, increased probability of conjunction. So at some point in time, there might be um, a position that a satellite operator should move. Uh, and if they don't move, what is the liability there? Or if they're, if they're asked not to move, but they move, and then uh, there's a, a conjunction of that cost of that. What is, the, what is your position on liability of move not to move? Right now, we don't have the tools that would allow us to make that decision. Um, and that we, I hope that we will eventually get to that point. Um, what we can do now is we advise people of a potential collision, right? That's really basically what we do. Uh, we can also um, go out and get, you know, we can 
we can work, and some of the operators, of course, are using commercial services to, when we say, hey, we think you could be in a place, sometimes they, they go to a commercial service and, and the commercial service says, yeah, you should maneuver or no, you shouldn't maneuver or you should maneuver, you know, delay your maneuver, your plan maneuver. So there are services now that are coming into being. Um, and part, and this is all around the fact that we are not, uh, we are not at the place where we are with air traffic control technically yet, where we can make an absolute determination. So right now the body of law about, I don't know, I guess, I don't even know how would that work, Larry. I mean, if if somebody, if we gave someone a conjunction data message and they chose not to move because their calculation was different than ours, and and they smashed into somebody else's satellite, is it well, government? The claims commission in the uh, the arbitration court uh, under the liability conventions, because if it's in space, it's fault based, so it's not absolute liability or. Uh, a, uh, an absolute, uh, if, if there's damage to an aircraft in flight or anything on the surface of the earth, it's absolute liability. If it's in space, it's based on fault. And so I paid these guys to be here. You're going to have an arbitration panel waiting. So they had a lot of car accident. Did, the, did that car driver uh, in the Tesla and the, uh, the full self driving system, did it have a chance to escape and did it use it? So great issues coming up, great issues coming up for lawyers, for technology. Yes, the back. Yeah, Mike Barnesville Labs. Um, you know, we know that the uh, problem in, uh, in terms of space is growing exponentially and not literally. Uh, what expectations does uh, Congress have that that funding has to be able to grow exponentially to allow commercial companies to keep up with problems? So the... There, there's sort of two big pots of money, right? So DOD is still carrying the heavier load. I mean, it, it is still their network that is the backbone. Um, and these are billions of dollars of assets. Okay, so, so there's funding will continue to go into DOD. And also DOD is funding a bunch of programs that we are aware of and that are helping us. Um, uh, where's Travis? Travis. Travis knows all about this. Um, like Space Watch and the, the, there's a bunch of DOD programs that are looking at things like can you use uh, orbital assets to gather better data about about debris and active objects and so there's a bunch of spending happening on the national security side that will ultimately benefit us. Uh, we just got our first real budget this year. So my predecessor, Kevin O'Connell, um, uh, had to struggle for a couple of years with really no, basically no budget. And then this year, Congress gave me $70 million to really get started. Um, and so our expectation is that those numbers are going to continue to increase so that we'll have a real investment, in the first, or we'll have a real investment on the Department of Commerce side and real investment on the defense side. And, and separately from us, of course, is the commercial companies uh, have all uh, invested tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to build systems. So there, there is a, in the US, there's a really big investment going into the, both the science and the technology associated with SSA. Uh, and that's why gets back to my point of us trying not to disrupt that commercial investment, that commercial investment cycle, because that's an important, uh, that, that's a really important piece of this puzzle. So, yeah, so the answer is, I think so. Uh, so far, Congress and this, and luckily, you know, uh, this is not a partisan issue in Congress. I mean, I've gotten, I mean, we've had great dialogue with, with both Republicans and Democrats on this. So, you know, when they tell you Washington's completely broken, that's a little bit of hyperbole. There, there are issues about which we routinely sit down and work together, and this has been a good one. Yes? Um, so when you talk about, obviously we know your office is under research, so you're trying to build that up, and that's what part of the funding is for. Can you talk about where you are with that now? And then secondly, about the, uh, 
at all that was incomplete on the floor about moving OSB out from under NOLA and under the park. Yeah, um, Rich, you know, the office, our office started out as a little advocacy office, believe it or not, I, in the Reagan administration. Um, it started out as a little advocacy office for space. And when before there was really truly a commercial space industry. Um, and it's sort of been bounced around the Department of Commerce for a while. It was recently in Nesdis, and again, this is you know inside Washington baseball, but you know, Nesdis does the weather program, right? So it 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 was a weird fit. I mean, they buy satellites and fly satellites and they didn't really want this responsibility. So um, with Congress's urging, we moved it out of Nesdis into the office of uh, the undersecretary. Um, where we are today, I'm comfortable with that. I mean, you know, there's arguments for pulling it out and doing something else with it, um, putting it in the office of the secretary and all of that. But right now we're making progress. My big issues are really boring ones. Um, it's the government hiring system is just god awful. It's just, I have all sorts of really talented people who want to come and work with us, and getting them in the door is takes Herculean effort. No, no less than four or five, six months, and it, it's just mind boggling. I get all these great people who are practically willing to, who would probably commit their time practically free to, to come and work on this program. Um, and I can't, I can't get them in the world. So that's a major frustration. And the other one is, is, is uh, acquisition stuff. So um, I have a relationship with uh, Travis uh, at NASA. And uh, the deputy at NASA, uh, Pam Melroy, has been super supportive of our efforts. And NASA is going to try to help us on some on some acquisition stuff. Um, but the Department of Commerce recently got a bunch of huge money, right? So chip, the chips program, the broadband program, all these programs that within the last couple of years have gotten have been given to the Department of Commerce. That means that the people in the Department of Commerce who do routine functions like uh, acquisition, right there, as you can imagine, this means the government, their elaborate processes. There's only one group of those people, right? And so if they're off working on a $5 billion chips program, and I come in and go, hey, I need, pri I need priority, they just start laughing. Um, so uh, part of the problem is just the, we're moving at the pace of government in an industry that's moving much, much, much faster. And that's my greatest frustration is there are pieces of the government puzzle that I can't fix, like hiring and acquisition. So on acquisition, I can rely on my friends. Um, you know, I can do things through DOD. I can do things through NASA. So I can do workarounds for the acquisition piece, but the hiring piece, I have 15 open billets right now, 15. Um, and we're just slowly moving them through the system. Keep your eyes on our website if you're looking for a job. There's all kinds of cool jobs coming up. Um, six months later. <laughs> six months later. You might want to get a part-time job when you apply so that you can, yes. Are, are we done? Are we, are we good? All right. I think I'm getting well, one last question, and I think I'm getting the uh, the hook. Hi, Rich. Nate Daly, the Mitre Corporation. Uh, a quick question for you: Do you have a counterpart in Australia, UK, Germany, inter international? And, and the reason I ask is because I have another hat as the regional vice president of the Space Force Association, and one of the things we do is is convene discourses, international discourses for not just defense and security, but also also commerce. Oh wow, we we need to talk. Let me tell you why. Um, one of the things that we do, which is White House sponsored, and this has been going on for a while, is as part of our normal diplomatic outreach, we do these comprehensive space dialogues. So we, the, the traditional ones are France and, and Japan. We've been doing, I think Japan, we're in our eighth or ninth year or something like that. Um, but what we're trying to do uh, now is when we have these government to government dialogues, and this, I'm going to get into wonky government speak here for a moment. 
we call it a track 1.5. Uh, track one is when governments talk to each other and track two is when uh, private entities talk to each other and a track 1.5 is when we orchestrate something so that the commercial sector is having a dialogue in front of the government officials of several governments. And so we actually are heading off at the end of this month. My team, in addition to, we sort of have three. We have a regulatory team, we have a policy international team, and we have the SSA team. The SSA team is the biggest, but the policy team is doing the track 1.5s. And um, we, we are currently working with industry associations and we all always welcome new partners for doing that because we think it's really helpful to have a dialogue. This is an international issue. There are always complicated questions, questions like export control. Um, uh, there are a regulatory thicket that keeps countries from working with each other. So we would welcome an opportunity to work with you guys. We, I think the this administration at least is committed to having a number of international dialogues. I think in addition to the one, to the bilaterals, there's also the Quad, which is India, uh, U.S., yeah. Japan, and who's Australia. Australia. Sorry, yes, I think uh, I think we're probably going to look at doing something in the fall in Australia. So, um, would love would love to talk about that. Thank you so much. You have uh, been great. And I'm sorry I've, I've rambled on and on and on, but I, I had all these really experts in the audience that I paid to come here and planted down with the debate. Uh, thank you very much. And um, look at the RFI, the um, basic services RFI. I don't have the link, but all of the, all of the responses are actually online for you to look at. So you can, look with your own eyes at what every, all the smartest people in the world said about basic services. Um, and if, if we don't have that now, I can get the link if people want the link later, or unless Travis, do you have, do you? Oh, we can get it for everyone. We can get it for everybody. But it's basic.commerce.gov and it's right on the main homepage. Yeah, but look at it. I mean, there's a ton of great data there. Can I ask you one more question about satellite export control? Uh, yes, I think I'm getting the I'm getting moved along, but a quick question. Okay, um, again, Native American between the Native Americans in the United States and First Nations people in Canada, that the Department of um, Department of um, State will not um, not allow satellite export control to First Nations people in Canada. And I just wanted to know that to let you know that that might be something that is important. Okay. Well, I, I didn't know that. that. That is very that is very interesting. So maybe we could follow up on that. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Go hear some live music tonight before you go home. Yes.